This video was requested by a patron. Patrons in the top tier not only get early access to videos, but get the ability to request future video topics for me to cover. To become a patron, click the card in the upper right corner, or the link in the description. And now, on with our feature presentation. Steve Largent is one of the greatest wide receivers in the history of the National Football League. If you were to rank the top five receivers to ever play this sport, odds are, you would have Largen inside the top five, because he was that good. And while some wrongly say that Steve Largent was just a possession-wide receiver, in actuality, he was so much more than that. Sure, he may not have been able to beat you over the top, but he could still beat you in many different ways. You don't average 16 yards per reception and finish inside the top 10 in that category multiple times by accident. As Charlie Rones, the Buffalo Bills quarterback, said on Largent and how good he is, he's very deceiving. He uses a lot of other things to make up for not having a lot of speed. His routes are picture perfect, and he's got excellent concentration. You can be right on him, and he still can make the catch. And Largent knew this and used it to his advantage in route to one of the greatest careers in the history of the sport, where he finished with 819 receptions, 13,089 yards, and 100 touchdowns, along with seven Pro Bowls, a Hall of Fame induction on the first ballot, and an all-1980s first-team selection. By the time Largent's career was done, he was first all-time in receptions, with only one other player, San Diego Chargers wideout Charlie Joyner, even having more than 700, and less than 50 players in league history, even having half as many catches. He was first all-time in receiving yards, at a time where only six other players eclipsed the 10,000-yard mark, and was first all-time in receiving touchdowns, as the only man in league history to ever score 100 receiving touchdowns. That means that when he retired, he was first all-time in every major category. Largen truly was a legend in every sense of the word, and if you want to learn more about him and his incredible career, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But when you break it down, of the many great seasons that Largen had, what was the best one of the bunch? I mean, the man played 14 seasons in the league and was so good that he got his number retired, with no other player in Seahawks history minus the brief time that Jerry Rice joined the team in 2004, ever donning that number. But of those 14 seasons, which one was the best one? Well, many would argue, and understandably so, that it was 1985. Was it a great season for the Seahawks from an on-the-field perspective? Not so much. They disappointed and fell below expectations, as after two straight seasons where they made the playoffs, they went just 8-8. Eight and eight. If you want to learn more about that 1985 Seahawks team, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But for Largent, it was a great season from an individual perspective. He ended the year as an AP First Team All-Pro, which, oddly enough, was the only time he had ever been named a First Team All-Pro, though he received his fair share of Second Team All-Pro nominations. He had 79 receptions, which was a career high, and ranked 6th in the NFL. He had 1,287 receiving yards, which was a career high and led the league, marking the second time, alongside the 1979 season, that he led the NFL in that category. And his 1,287 receiving yards, at the time, was a franchise record, and was a Seahawks record that actually stood all the way until 2020, when DK Metcalf broke the record with 1,303 yards, three and a half decades later. So 1985 was the best season of Largent's career from an accolades perspective and a statistics perspective. But when you break it down even further, in his best season, what was his best game? During which game did Largent, in 1985, just dominate defenses even more than he usually did and went off? Well, that would be a November game in the middle of the season against the New England Patriots. His crown achievement during his crown season. 
And the story behind this scheme is absolutely heartbreaking. And at the same time, absolutely beautiful. We've seen plenty of instances of players rising to the occasion in the wake of a tragedy. Like Brett Favre on Monday Night Football against the Oakland Raiders after his dad died. Or like Detroit Lions quarterback Gary Danielson during week two of the 1980 season against the Green Bay Packers. In a game that you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And this game by Steve Largent is a game that you might not know about, but it is no exception. Because the best game during Steve Largent's best season came in the wake of an unspeakable tragedy where he was debating whether or not to even play, decided to play, and had one of the best games of his entire career. And this is the story behind the craziest game considering all the circumstances of Steve Largent's legendary professional football career. Before I talk about the actual game in question and how Largent himself performed, we need some context to understand the importance of this game, how Largent was doing thus far, and what exactly happened before the game that had Largent contemplating life. It's November 17th, 1985. It's week 11 of the NFL season. And as we're well into the season, and really starting to see the playoff picture come into fold, we have a big AFC battle on our hands over at the Kingdom up in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle, between the Seattle Seahawks and the New England Patriots. This was a monumental game for both of these teams, because the playoff picture in the AFC was shaping up to be a giant mess. However, for the purposes of our story, we're just going to talk about what this meant for the Seahawks, who entered this one at 6-4, on the verge of a bizarre start to the season, where they won two straight to go to 2 0, then lost two straight to drop to 2 and 2, then won two straight to go to 4 and 2, then lost two straight to drop to 4 and 4, then won two straight to go to 6 and 4. They were desperately hoping that this pattern would not repeat itself in this monumental AFC battle, which was so big that you had Dick Emberg and Merlin Olsen on the call for NBC, which was always a good sign. Seattle entered this one at 6-4, one game back of the Denver Broncos for first place in the AFC West. However, in the AFC, excluding the AFC Central, since one team was guaranteed to make it in that division despite being terrible, you had six teams at 6-4 or better fighting for just four spots. So if you're the Seahawks, you truly had no room for error here. Lose this game, and you've essentially got to run the table to have any chance whatsoever at making it to the playoffs, considering how competitive the conference was. If the Seahawks were going to beat a very good Patriots team, which sat at 7-3 and, and tied with the New York Jets and the Denver Broncos for the best record in the AFC, then they were going to need to play a great game and have a great outing offensively. And that meant that in all likelihood, this man right here, Steve Largen, was going to have to ball out and play a fantastic game. However, that was nothing new for Largent, who had firmly established himself as one of the best receivers in NFL history by this point in his career. Because after a 1984 season where he had 74 receptions, which was the second most of his career at the time, 1,164 receiving yards, which was the third most of his career at the time, 12 receiving touchdowns, which was the most in his career and set a franchise record at the time and was good enough to be named a Pro Bowler and an AP Second Team All-Pro, he was picking up right where he left off to start off 1985. Through the first 10 games of the season, he was a big reason why the Seahawks were above 500 and were competing for a playoff spot, as you can see through all of these highlights. 10 games into the season, and he already had 47 receptions for 742 yards. He was on pace to finish the season with 75 receptions, or even more than he had in 1984, and over 1,187 yards, which was also more than he had in 1984. He was a man who, quite simply, could not be stopped, and he had tons of momentum on his side, especially since the previous week, in a 27-3 victory against the New Orleans Saints, he torched the Saints with five catches 
for a then season high 110 yards. If Largent could do to the Patriots, who had a very good defense, mind you, what he did to just about every single team he faced in 1985 thus far, then the Seahawks had a great chance of winning this one and giving themselves some breathing room in a suffocating conference. And it seemed like everything was trending upward for Largent. From an individual level, he was coming off of that great game against the Saints, and he now only needed three more receptions to reach 50 on the season, which was a big deal, because it would have made him, at the time, the first player in NFL history to have eight seasons with 50 or more catches, as the previous record was seven, held by four other guys besides Largent, including, oddly enough, Patriots head coach Raymond Berry, as in this week's opponent, Art Powell, Lance Allworth, and Charlie Taylor. From a team level, his Seahawks were 6-4 and four and were coming off of two straight wins, and dominating wins at that, where they outscored the Los Angeles Raiders and New Orleans Saints by a combined score of 60-6. to six. They won those two games by an average of 27 points. And from a personal level, he was about to welcome a new child into the world. Now, childbirth was nothing new for the Largens, as Steve and his wife and high school sweetheart, Terry, had given birth to three kids before. As prior to the fourth child, they welcomed two boys, Kyle and Kelly, and one girl, Cassie, into the world. Now, they were going to welcome a fourth child, just one day after the Seahawks played the Saints. This one was a boy named Kramer James Larger, with the middle name actually being an ode to Jim Zorn, a longtime friend of Largent and the quarterback of the Seahawks for quite some time. Largent actually joked that he gave Kramer the middle name of James after our late quarterback. Now, I want to note before going any further that everything I say is based on the information available at the time when Kramer was a baby. And this video is not about what would happen to Kramer years down the road. So if you do want to look that up, you can do the research afterwards although I will not be mentioning it for the rest of the video, and I will warn you that it is quite disturbing and quite shocking. Having said that, it seemed like this birth was going to go swimmingly, just like the last three. And from all indications, it did. Largent never brought up anything in practice or before the game about the birth. All we knew was that the 9-pound, 23-inch son born during the middle of the Monday Night Football game between the San Francisco 49ers and the Denver Broncos, was born. You always assume with something like this, that no news is good news. And the fans and the broadcast team, understandably so, felt the same thing. Listen and watch this part of the broadcast, where the fans are congratulating him on the birth of his fourth child, and the announcers are happy for him, as though everything was going perfectly. An ordinary play for most of these fans. Congratulations. I guess those are those that just uh, finished their degree. Of course, congratulations on the newborn baby. Again, this seemed like a normal birth. Until it wasn't. Because as it turned out, Kramer James Largent was born with a birth defect. He was born with spina bifida, which is when the baby's spinal cord does not develop properly. It can have lifelong implications, as a baby born with this condition may never be able to use their legs fully, and may never have normal use of their legs, bowels, and bladder. One out of every 2,000 children in the United States are born with spina bifida, as even though it is the most common central nervous system birth defect, impacting 1,500 babies in the USA every year, it is still pretty rare, all things considered seeing as you've got a 0.05% chance of being born with that condition. However, Steve could never have expected that his fourth child would be born with this condition, especially after the first three births went off swimmingly. As his wife, Terry, would later say on the birth, we were having such a great time in the delivery room, joking around with the doctor. Kramer was born, and I was ecstatic and euphoric. A few seconds later, I heard, Ah, uh, we have a little defect here. I felt like somebody had just dropped a load of logs right on my heart. Steve broke down and cried. 
It tore me up to see him crying so hard. And as Steve later said, the first thing the doctor says to me when he pulls Kramer out, and this was the same doctor, same hospital, and same setup that we'd gone through three times before. So I felt a bit like a veteran at this. He turned to me and he said, Steve, we've got a problem here. Kramer's got a hole in his back. This is called spina bifida. He said, you're going to face a lifetime of decisions you have to make about and for Kramer. When he said that to me, it crushed me. I fell back, I sat down in the chair, and I just started sobbing and crying uncontrollably. The good news, at least, was that at no point was Kramer's life in danger. Even though the baby had to stay in the hospital for a week after the birth, at no point did Steve or Terry or any of the doctors expect the baby to die. But the news absolutely destroyed Steve, and understandably so. His baby was born with an opening the size of a quarter in his lower back that would impact his life forever. And obviously, with this news, no one in their right mind would be upset with Steve Largent if he decided not to play in the game. If he needed to take the next few days to be with Terry and to be with his newborn baby throughout this incredibly difficult process, it would have been completely justifiable. But for Steve, in the wake of the tragedy, as much as it was going to hurt, and as hard as it was for him to focus on football and think about a game at a time like this, he was going to play in this game against the Patriots. Part of it was just the camaraderie that football provided. As Largen said back in 1984, when talking about why he was one of the just three veteran players on the Seahawks in 1982 who opposed the strike, the most important thing about playing football, or the thing that makes it the most fun, is the camaraderie you have with your teammates. Maybe playing in this game and being with his teammates would help him in many ways. And adding on to that, part of it was just the therapeutic nature of it, and just having something to take his mind off of this horrible tragedy. For some people, when something unspeakable happens to them that rocks their world, the way they cope with it is to do something else to get their mind off of it. Because if they weren't doing something else, their mind would just be consumed by nothing but that tragedy. Said Largent, it was like my whole world collapsed on me. This has been one of the most difficult weeks of my life. Preparing for the Patriots game was really difficult. I know I was on the practice field all week, thinking this is the last place in the world I want to be. In fact, I found myself saying, I'm out here playing a silly game, and a part of me is lying in a hospital bed. But playing in the game was fantastic therapy maintaining a semblance of continuity, order, and normalcy to my life. Once the game started, my concentration was very focused. I can't think of a time when I was in the game and not thinking about catching the ball or doing the proper assignment. Largen kept this all to himself during the week. Again, no one on the team or in the media had any idea that he was going through this, and that Kramer, in fact, was not born healthy, but he was going to play. He felt that he owed it to his teammates and felt that it was a way to take his mind off of things. And even though the Seahawks lost this game 20-13, allowing the game-winning touchdown in the final three minutes of the contest, you couldn't blame Steve Larger for this. Not at all. In fact, Larger had the best game of his incredible 1985 season on this day. When dealing with tragedy, he had a personal triumph. When the final whistle sounded, Largen finished the game with 8 receptions for 138 yards, and that doesn't even include a 65-yard touchdown that he had in the second half that got called back due to a holding penalty. Just to give you some perspective on how well Largen played in this game, in comparison to the rest of his 1985 season, which again, was the best season of his career, here's a look at all 16 games that Largen had from a reception standpoint. The Patriots game was the best game of the season, where he had 8, tying the 8 catches he had in Week 6 during the team's 30-26 victory over the Atlanta Falcons. 
And here's a look at all 16 games that Largent had from a yardage standpoint. The Patriots game was the best game of the season, where he had 138. It was the only game all season where he had more than 110 yards. Again, no one could blame Largent whatsoever if football was the furthest thing from his mind. But he not only played against all odds, but had one of the best games of his entire career and had his best game of the season. That is a true professional right there. I should also note that Steve Largent did this against a really good Patriots defense. Sure, they might not have been 85 Bears good, but they were still one of the best defenses in the NFL in the 1985 season. They had the six fewest points allowed that year, they had the second fewest passing touchdowns allowed that year, and they were inside the top 10 in every single statistical passing category possible. Steve Largent put up these numbers against a really, really good defense, as in a defense that had not allowed any receiver prior to this game to have more than seven catches. And in the previous week against the Indianapolis Colts, not a single player on that team had 60 receiving yards. And yet, the player on this team right here, the Seattle Seahawks, the legend himself, Steve Largent, did all of this under the most improbable of circumstances. Truly a legend in every sense of the word. Steve Largent was a heck of a player and a heck of a person. And perhaps no one game exhibits that more than this battle against the Patriots. Sure, Largent's had crazy games in his career, like his iconic 1987 game against strike players against the Detroit Lions, where he had 15 catches for 261 yards and 3 touchdowns, his two-touchdown performance in the 1987 wildcard round against the Houston Oilers, and his 12-catch, 191-yard game against the Denver Broncos in a 3-point win in 1984. But nothing that he ever did on the field was more remarkable and more important than this game against the Patriots. To do all of that, just moments after your child was born with a life-altering birth defect, and to play in this game when football was the furthest thing from your mind, is remarkable. And when people talk about why Steve Largent is one of the greatest to ever do it, chalk this one up as yet another example in that Hall of Fame legacy of his. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.